All right, John chapter 12. So the Gospel of John, we're walking in the last week of Jesus' life. And so um, I would expect the things that he is saying, and I think this is right, are more concentrate towards the Gospel. These are, not that all his words aren't important, but these are heightened words. And, and in John chapter 12, we have seen already the matter of light, and that he is the light. In verse 35 and 36, we've seen the matter of sovereign salvation, you know, I, the, the reason these people won't believe is because Isaiah the prophet said that they're not going to believe because they have, you know, blinded eyes. And God has blinded their eyes so that they would not believe and be converted. That's what the verses say. You know, that's shocking. You know, and I ask you, what am I supposed to tell you? Am I supposed to, like, not, bl- not say that this is God who's blinding their eyes when it says right there in the verse that it is? So, you know, we've seen that. And uh, we come tonight to a matter that we put on pause from last week, and it's in verse 42 and verse 43. And we realize that that although this passage is saying that the people had seen miracles and they had not believed, there were some there that, I put in quotations, believed. Okay? Believed, quote, unquote. Let's pause for my own heart and your heart and ask God to focus our thoughts. Lord, we're just going to take a little bit of time to look in your word and to hopefully accurately say what you say. Help us look through your eyes, Lord. Help us to be right on target of what you meant, and I pray that you'll give help. Spirit of God, I yield to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's see, beginning of verse number 42 and 43, the matter of man-pleasing. The matter of man-pleasing. If you have the sheet from last week, uh, you can fill in that section. We don't have new sheets this week, but you can fill it in if you had it last week. Here we go, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him. Okay, that's quote, unquote, believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And I told you I wanted to take a lot of time with this this week because that is such a telling and a powerful verse. Look at it again. Verse 43, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. So I want to take a quick poll here, and you play poll here with me. I'm I'm going to ask you the question, how many of you think that these people were saved? And how many people think that they're not saved? Okay, so it says that they believe, it uses that word, but they would not publicly confess him because they're afraid of getting kicked out of the synagogue. Okay, so how many of you would say, I think that they are believers, these people? Raise your hand if you think that they are believers. All right, let let me say that in a different way. Put your hands down. Sorry. How many of you think they are saved? How many of you think that they are saved? Raise your hands if you think they're saved. Okay. How many of you say, no, I don't believe these people are saved? Raise your hand. Oh, this is good. All right. Here we go. So we, uh, you know, we got a split crowd here. Uh, well, let, would, it, would it change your mind if I remind you of a verse in Matthew 10, 32 that says this? Whosoever, therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Does that change your perspective, any of your hands, a little bit? Okay, there is a belief, a type of belief, that you know, we, the, you probably heard it, head knowledge. There is a head knowledge kind of belief where you know that Jesus was real, you believe maybe that he was the Messiah, whatever, you're convinced on that side, but it is a different thing to confess him as your Lord and Savior. And the Bible is pretty strong that whoever denies and will not confess him publicly is not saved. I guess I would lean here towards the no, they are not saved, but even in the commentaries there's a fight over this. They believed, but they wouldn't publicly confess Christ You know, and and some commentaries think, well, you know, maybe they got saved later. Okay, let me give that to you, maybe later on, because some of them, the scripture says, did come out and believed him, believed on, or or confessed him later. To me, this does seem like head knowledge of being convinced that he was the Christ, but without any active salvation faith to confess publicly and to follow him. It's not enough to have a head knowledge. You know, and I've talked to a lot of people that a head knowledge of Jesus, you know, they agree with that, but they, they will not follow him. They will not publicly confess him. They will not publicly be baptized and say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. There's something missing there. There's something really missing. So, however, 
and I don't want to waffle, but I want to say this. However, these people, look at the, what's the first word of verse 42? Nevertheless, this is a contrast with the last group of people who were, we were told that they could not believe because God had blinded their eyes. So if this is a contrast, then maybe there's an argument to be made that they could believe, and maybe they did get saved later. Only God knows. But I do want to spend a moment and strongly rebuke their cowardice and their worldliness and unbelief and fear and insecurity of loving the praise of man more than the praise of God. Now, this hits home to every one of us here tonight, especially this pastor. Everyone in some areas struggles with the approval of other people, wanting the approval of other people. The Bible says that that kind of idea is a trap to you. It is a snare. Listen to the word of God. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. That is, when I am afraid what Steve thinks of me, when I am afraid of whether uh, Pat will approve of me, when I am, whatever, put your name in there, okay? It's funny, when you're up here preaching, you forget people's names, don't you? You're pastor, you're pastor oh, yeah, Pritt, yeah. All right. The fear of man brings a snare. Any of you guys, when you were younger, back in the woods, use snares? Any of you guys? Any women for that, maybe? No? Traps? I know that some of you have traps. I know Al Schumacher has a trap. You know, a snare is something that gets a hold of a rodent or maybe a little bit bigger animal. You know, sometimes there is a, a hook snare or a, a wire snare that grabs a hold of the leg, whatever, and uh, it, it's a trap. So tell me how fearing the approval of other people is a trap. Every, I know everybody's connecting because I can see it in your eyes. You know, how is that a trap to you? Okay, keeps you from doing what maybe the Holy Spirit wants you to do. How is fearing men approval a trap? Yes. Right. Why is it so powerful then, Donna? Why did why do why is it because we're here? Okay, okay, I'm going to comment on that, but, and I want to push the pause button and, and connect it. One of the things I'm going to say in a minute is that these, the Pharisees were more real to these people than God was. So they choose what pleased them instead of God. They're more real because we're here. Okay? What? Yes, Casey. Right. And who doesn't want to feel that approval? Who wants, to, who wants to be in the conflict of other people not being happy with you or disapproving of you? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That. Okay. Let me say this. Go ahead, Pat. Right, and, and I'm going to come back to that idea here in a second. We could go all night here. Yes. I want to not come back to that belief, okay, in the secret to be beloved. I go to, I go to John 19, and he talks about Joseph of Arimathea, and also talks about this table. Those, those guys are going to come out publicly and put Jesus Christ out of the way. Yeah. 
And, and I think that you're right. And I think that maybe this gives a little bit of window that maybe these guys came out publicly later. I'm just like whooping on them right now. <laughs> and God is too in this verse. Yes. Right. You see the phrasing. It's just so literal. It's so they they because they love the praise of men. Okay. There's an approval factor. There is there is that that they are accepted by men more than the praise, more than the approval of God. Were you going to say something, Tyra? No. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. sorry you raise your hand. I see that. There's two hundred dollars right there. That man right there. All right. The older I get, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say that yet. But the older I get in the Lord the more I realize that opinions, the opinions and the approval and the accolades of man just really don't matter a whole lot. I mean, it's, it, it can't form who you are, who I am, who you are. And, and we give power uh, in our lives to people and we do things or we don't do things based on, on someone who we respect or someone who we're afraid of. And it's really not the way to live life. It's not really who should matter. The Lord should matter. You're just giving people power over you. And what matters is really what the Lord thinks about what you're doing, right? Not what people, not what other people say or, or how other people bully you or criticize or disagree or, or would say don't do that or uh, approval. The, the people, the Pharisees uh, in front of them were more real to them. Here's, here's the point Donna was making. They were more real to them than Jesus or God was. You know, what was real to them is that they had Pharisees, and it was, Pat was right, this strong tradition, this was a national religion. You couldn't just go to the church down the road. It was more real to them than what God thought about them. This is a form of unbelief, I suppose, but it is super common in all of us. We allow people's opinions to rule us rather than God's opinion. Now, it's one thing to look at it in this passage. I want to pull this verse kind of out and apply it directly really to us. Can I suggest, suggest to you this is why Facebook is so controlling to some people? Because they are controlled by the approvals. They want the approvals of other people. They want to put their life in front of other people and for other people to say, Wow, I wish I got a new house. Wow, I wish I looked like you. Wow, what a beautiful family. Wow, that's the best dog I've ever seen in my life. And they're fueled as a drug by the approvals. This is like the whole, the whole selfie thing, you know, especially among younger women who are seeking security, who want 14 people to post under their selfie, you're beautiful. They want, they need to hear that. They want to hear that. Maybe they're not getting it from their dad. Maybe they're not getting it from their spouse, whatever, but they need that that approval, and if you're, you know, if you're posting selfies, you know, then I'm not talking about you. I don't particularly. Now, you know, if you're like 78 and you're posting selfies, okay, all right, we got, we got us a problem. That may actually be against the law. All right, <laughs> but this is uh, this approval thing is huge in our lives. It's like a drug. It's a drug that's a trap. We cannot live our uh, our lives to do something. Uh, some things and not do other things based on the opinions of people and other people, what they think. This has so many applications to you and to me, you know, and probably many applications are running through your brain here tonight. In the context, it is salvation. In the context here, we need to consider that, that if we accept Jesus like these people were called to, we will suffer at the opinions, the words, the actions of others sometimes. Okay, the life of Jesus Christ, following him, is a life of suffering. Don't let anyone lie to you. Don't let any Pentecostal or charismatic that is preaching a prosperity gospel lie to you that if, since you trust Jesus Christ, everything's going to get better. No, that's not true. Yea, all that live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution, the scripture says. You know, it is, it is the cost of throwing your lot in with Jesus, of, of being a Jesus person, of standing and saying the things that he would say, repeating him, of mimicking Jesus Christ, uh, of standing for what he would stand and standing against what he would stand. It is the new life uh, risk. Sometimes immature believers, I, I would just say this, you know, this is not just a matter of the lost because the saved can sometimes be the most brutal 
disapprovers, whatever, uh, immature believers can be the most brutal to their brothers in Christ because they don't understand some mature things. They don't understand what it means to walk in the Lord. Being excommunicated from the Jewish religion, Pat was talking about making this connection uh, with how she grew up. Being excommunicated from their the religion, the Jewish religion was equal to, to these folks of getting kicked out of heaven. There was no other option. I mean, there was one God-chosen people for all they knew, and you break, you break ties with that. You don't go to the church across town. You can't. All right, the, cro- the church, the synagogue in the next town is directly connected to this town. Okay, you, there's no, you know, you don't, no, no, no synagogue hopping. <laughs> you know, we just church, you know, you get mad at which you just go to no church. It was a comprehensive national religion. You could just, you know, the approvals of these people really matter. This application has application to salvation. They would not confess Christ publicly as their savior, at least at this point. And that has to be the starting place of choosing God's praise over man's praise. To publicly confess Christ. To publicly stand with Jesus Christ. We were driving through Newark. (laughs) Was it this week? And we saw the the guy with a placard. Um, Chris, you know that guy. And he's got verses on it, salvation verses. He doesn't look crazy. You know, he's not not one of the, there are crazy ones. But he's just got salvation like we would... And, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He had another guy, a young guy with him, holding those placards, whatever. I want to tell you, you can say whatever you want to say about the guy, that guy. He is taking his stand with Jesus Christ. Without a doubt, he does not care what those, the sneering college students around him. He is taking a stand for Christ so that someone else may see his witness and see the verses and believe on Christ. Okay? So, you know, being, standing with Christ is a place of suffering it is a starting place of choosing God's praise over man's pra- praise. But this extends even further, especially in our culture. And I want to stretch this farther. And I want you to see that we're coming right out of the verse again. Look at verse number 43. For they love the praise of, of men more than the praise of God. In our society today, what is going on has to be talked about. I am not a political pastor. I do not follow you know, my sermons based on what's going on in Washington or the world. I think if you ignore that, you're like an ostrich with its head in the sand. I mean, I think this is your reality and my reality, what's going on around us, and it has to be addressed. But right now in our culture, we are thrust into a position where in many areas we have to take a stand with God over our popular society. So over the majority of society, and that stand includes, uh, you know, God's definition of marriage. It includes standing for the children, the babies, abortion. It stands against abortion. It, it stands against euthanasia. Once people get to a certain age, you know, you don't make a decision that they're not useful anymore. And so you, you know, you, know, you encourage them. You know, you'd probably be better off if you took, you know, if you doctor assisted suicide and all that. No, it's wrong. It's immoral. Evolution, you know, we didn't come from single cell, all that, you know, we came from, God said, let there be, bang, okay, God is the creator, six day, young earth, and you're going to have to choose who you stand with, and it is, it is now, you don't, you can't just hide somewhere in this, you know, you're going to stand with political correctness and popular opinion or God, I want you to think of this a moment, Will you stand with Jesus when it comes down to the risk? This is a risk, what these guys were going through. So will you stand with Jesus Christ when it becomes dangerous and expensive in America to do so? You know, I thought my pastor growing up, I thought you know, his generation were alarmists. No one acu- would accuse me here of being alarmist unless you didn't, never watch the news. Okay, this is here. I'm not talking about some time it coming. You know, it is here right now. This week, many um, Christians, prominent Christians, signed a, it's called the Pledge. I don't know if you saw this, but it is a message to the Supreme Court that, um, that you know, if you pass a law for same-sex marriage that is enforceable against those who would discriminate against it, we will disobey. We will engage in civil disobedience where it applies to us. Where it applies, you know, the past, most of them were pastors, many of them were pastors, you know, um, so some of them were like, you know, James Dobson and uh, Rick Santorum and Mike Huckabee and uh, some of these guys and other, you know, prominent pastors that 
we are not going to obey this. We will disobey the law. How, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about pitching the tea into the bay? You know, you're com we're coming to a point where these, you're going to have to make decisions. It's going to affect your taxes. You know, that's where the starting place will be. Um, are you going to stand with Christ and the word of God when it becomes dangerous? Are you going to love the praise of God more than the praise of men? When you're forced at work to sign a diversity training form that says you will not speak against sexual orientation, are you going to sign that? And, and I don't want to ask because some of you, are, are, you already have diversity cl classes, okay? I don't know how far that goes and what they make you do. But you must stand with God, whatever it means. And to, to some, of it, some of you, it's going to mean promotions, the lack of them. To some of you, it's going to mean that you, you may lose your job and have to find a different job. But you've got to decide what you're going to do. Are you going to love the praise of God or the praise of men? And it's real stuff, and it really does matter. You're forever making that choice in the public record of what you're doing, in the public record of heaven, who you're standing with. When you're forced to perform a job or a service that violates your biblical conscience, like these bakeries and these photographers, are you going to say, I will close my business before I do that, before I violate what God says? What will you do? When you're involved in an office or neighborly conversation where the Bible conflicts with public opinion, it's hard, but will you speak up? I'm not asking you, God is not asking you to speak up nastily. God is asking you to take a stand and, and stand for him. When as your pastor, I am fined for refusing to do a same-sex marriage. When a couple comes, makes, makes a, uh, calls David, David has no idea in the office, they make an appointment, they show up, and it's two guys or two women. They say, we would like you to permit... And I say no, and I tell them why. And then it goes to the media, and then I'm, this church is sued. Okay, this is not, I'm not making this up. This is very real stuff. It's already happening. There's already news stories in America about this. So my question to you is, when that happens, and when I'm fined, what are you going to do? Okay, when, when we lose our tax-exempt status here, and... You give your tithes and offerings, and you do not get any tax benefit for doing it at all. Will you give the same amount then? You know, these are real things. You, as a believer, need to decide whether you will stand with Jesus or capitulate to society. Will you love the praise of men more than the praise of God? Our children are the very first generation that are raised in a society where the majority favors the Supreme Court making a law to allow same-sex marriage. Saw the stats today, U.S. News and World Report, 48% are in favor of the Supreme Court passing this law nationally. You say, well, that's not a majority. 36 oppose, 36% oppose. 14 won't comment. 14% won't comment. We are not, there is no moral majority in America. Just a minute, Mr. Larson, we'll let you comment at the end, okay? I got you at the end. We are not any longer the moral majority. There is no moral majority in America. You are on the other side. You're going to have to make some real decisions. I'm going to have to make some real decisions. This verse says that they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God, it is extremely applicable to us. Mr. Larson.
we are not the first generation to talk about this. When Scott Phillips comes, uh, and he always gives that history, t history presentation on, in July, over the July 4th, it'll be on July 5th, uh, I've asked him if he would consider sharing with our congregation the many times in U.S. history where pastors and churches have been involved in uh, changing policy, civil disobedience, leading, um, you know, leading the direction of the country. And there are some, some shocking things. We were down in Washington, and one of the things, that I forget if it's in the Capitol or exactly where it is. I shouldn't say this because I'm not a historian. But we were there for a leadership conference, Scott and I were, and he showed me, um, we were with David Barton, some of you know who, anybody know who David Barton is, okay, the historian and the leader, whatever, and there, each state, this is back in the day, each state was allowed to cho choose two people from their state, prominent people that had made a difference in our country and a difference in the state, and you know, there's a big marble um, cast of them, and they're all around, so there's, there's lots of these, you know, there's, there's two from every state all around, and David Barton shared with us, Scott shared with me, that I think it was most of them were pastors. They, the states chose the, them, of making a difference in the direction, whatever. You know, I, I think this is a bigger subject than we have time to cover, but we are to honor our government up to the point where they directly disobey God, and then we have to follow God, right? I mean, I think, I, I, okay, I want to say something because I think sometimes this comes off. We're going to end at this point. This kind of took a strange direction tonight, but I want to say this. I love the United States of America. And sometimes when I get very fervent about these things, um, some of the military guys come and they say to me, do you not love America, whatever. I do, and it's the greatest, I believe it's the greatest country on the face of the earth. I believe it is worth defending. I, w I believe it's worth fighting for. And I, I believe it's worth speaking up for. And, and to not allow, you know, the crazy unbiblical direction, but to be very vocal for. So I want you to know there's an awful lot about our country that we should just love and adore and really appreciate concerning the freedoms that we have. And it's not like, uh, you know, throw, uh, bash America now. It, you, you military guys are right. You know, it's, it's not let's bash America now. Let's love her. Let's pray for her. Let's pray for revival. Let's stand up and open our mouth in a way that is righteous and not just political bashing, but speaking for God, you know, speaking righteousness and uh, all of that. Okay, got to talk about